<laughs> Thanks, Stefan. I think I misunderstood your directions. I thought you needed two items, not three. So I'm going to talk about repair of intracranial aneurysms, but there's two, surgery and endovascular. <laughs> um, Three million people in the U.S. have uh, intracranial aneurysms, and about 1% or 30,000 have them rupture each year. This is um, a condition which, despite decreases in smoking and better hypertension control, the incidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage has not decreased over the years. The outcome has improved somewhat. In the 1970s, the fatality rate was 57%. In the 80s, it was 42%. And 2,000 and beyond, it's gone from 36 to 26% in that range. An aneurysm is a uh, dilated part of the artery, but it's not a normal artery wall. It has um, disordered connective tissue. It has gaps in the smooth muscle, and it lacks the internal elastic lamina. So when it ruptures, the blood, as we heard, goes around, goes to the outside of the blood vessels, which is... Um, very toxic, toxic. When it happens, the, the body seals it off for most patients, the patients who make it to the hospital, it probably seals off within about a minute. And it seals off because for about a minute, the intracranial pressure almost reaches a systolic blood pressure or equals it, and a fibrin clot develops and closes it off. But you end up with a scan like that in a severe case with um, major hemorrhage. The problem is it can re-rupture. Uh, the re-rupture in the first 24 hours is 4 to 14 percent, and this was recognized in the early part of the last century, and Dr. Dandy did the first surgery to uh, clip an aneurysm. They realized they were seeing these patients, and when the patient re-ruptures, the mortality rate doubles. So he put a clip across it. Um, this is without an angiogram. The patient presented with a third nerve palsy. And ironically, he used a cushing clip. They were kind of competitive colleagues. So he used a cushing silver clip to go across it. This type of clip was just a, a once and done clip. You put it on and could not do anything with it. The patient did, did well. However, the surgery did not catch on. Uh, craniotomy had a high mortality rate. So uh, when people presented with hemorrhage, for the most part, surgeons were occluding the carotid in the neck, even when they knew it was uh, aneurysm because that was um, a safer procedure, but not nearly as effective, because patients still could re-rupture. In the 1950s, there were advances with technology. So the clips now became, Dr. Mayfield developed a clip that had a spring mechanism, which allowed a clip to be able to go on and come off. So that means you could temporary clip arteries, and you could reposition a clip on the aneurysm. Uh, Dr. Drake was an innovator in the field. He developed some modifications where it's called a fenestration, where the clip could go around an adjacent artery to keep the artery open but still pinch off the aneurysm. Dr. Yassergill introduced neuromicrosurgery. He brought the microscope into our field before the surgeons were operating with, with glasses and a, a light overhead. Uh, so this opened a whole new world. Literally, uh, surgeons could see anatomy that they couldn't see before. So the the success of clipping the aneurysm well and not damaging surrounding structures improved. This is uh, current day microneurosurgery. And what we see on the left is that we have a wide range of titanium clips, all different sizes and shapes, different fenestrations and curves. So we can tailor it to uh, aneurysm. And, and the angiogram shows a very small pericolosal artery aneurysm which had ruptured three millimeters at, at biggest. And we have, um, that's a photograph through the microscope. It shows the clip across it, um, the proper size for it. In general, when you do surgery for aneurysms, uh, only four to eight percent will have some residual. And usually we leave a residual. Most times it's because we're trying to preserve the parent artery or vessels that are going by and not to include them in the clip. Uh, when an aneurysm is completely clipped with no residual, the chance of recurrence is very low. It's about 1.5% over five years. Um, if there is residual, however, they do tend to enlarge with a 25% recurrence over about four years. So that's the surgery. Endovascular therapy um, really evolved over the same time period. 
uh, Igas Moniz was a neurologist, a Portuguese neurologist, who did the first angiogram. He did it to uh, actually see tumors better, but it ended up being very good for, for uh, aneurysms. Uh, Brooks was a surgeon who did an embolic procedure. Um, it's not what we think of today as endovascular, but he, the person had a CC fistula, carotid cavernous fistula. He clamped the carotid, opened the carotid, put a piece of muscle in, closed the carotid, took the clamps off, and the muscle went up to the uh, fistula and blocked it off. So that was an embolic treatment. Werner um, had a young woman with a giant, cavern, uh, giant carotid aneurysm. He placed silver wire through the orbit into the aneurysm, several millimeters of wire, heated it to 80 degrees centigrade, and the patient evidently did well. The idea was to thrombose the aneurysm. A major advance came in 1953 when Seldinger developed the approach through the femoral artery, so now surgeons didn't have to cut down directly on an artery to gain access. They could go through a catheter. Sean Mullen was a neurosurgeon who had the idea of thrombosing the aneurysm uh, from the inside, so he would place a trocar uh, through a burr hole down right on top of the aneurysm and then place a little wire in and give an electric current. And the idea was that blood is negatively charged and uh, the current would cause thrombosis, which in the angiogram picture there, the, the, the aneurysm is gone. And in 1974, Serbanyanko uh, developed a balloon embolization. So these are balloons that could be placed through the catheter. They can occlude an artery like shown here. They occluded the carotid artery temporarily, or then they could be released. So the 1980s in endovascular surgery was the era of the balloons. Uh, he would place balloons into aneurysm, well, endovascular surgeons would place them into aneurysms, multiple balloons, to try to occlude the aneurysm. Unfortunately, some balloons deflated, and blood could also go around the balloon, so the aneurysm still may, um, some of them grew. The field was revolutionized in uh, 1991 when an Italian neurosurgeon, Guido Guglielmi, developed a uh, platinum wire that was helical, so it's wound very tightly. And when it can pass through the catheter, when it's released from the catheter, it forms predetermined diameter coils. These are two-dimensional here, but when you release them in an the aneurysm, they form like a basket, and they form a three-dimensional structure like that. And that can occlude the aneurysm. Uh, it actually it, it blocks about 30% of the aneurysm volume inside, but it's meant to tamponade and eventually cause thrombosis of the artery. Initially, it was thought that the electrothrombosis would cause a, I mean, the electro, um, the electro uh, stimulation would cause the thrombosis, but it's probably more the deterrent of the flow and thrombosis of the blood products that way. This is an example of a patient with a large anterior communicating aneurysm, which is completely coiled there. About 30 to 40 percent of aneurysms can be completely coiled. In a large, uh, the first large international trial for subarachnoid hemorrhage, 58 percent of the aneurysms were completely coiled. When there's complete coiling, 40 percent of patients will get recurrence over about five years of their aneurysm. Now, not all the recurrences are major. Some are small right at the base, so 25 percent of those will require recoiling to uh, prevent hemorrhage. There are two randomized trials that are often referred to. One is an international trial, ISAT, and the other is uh, a barrel uh, trial in Arizona. And that was a single institution trial. The other was multi-institution. The results were identical. Patients either had coiling or clipping. And at one year, the poor outcome was 23% for coiling and higher for clipping, 30%. Significant. Same for Brett, 23 and, well, about 33%, roughly the same. Now we have long-term follow-up from those studies. So the 10-year follow-up from ISAT shows that coiling still has more survivors, 83% versus 79% for clipping. There were more recurrent hemorrhages with coiling. There's more retreatments, but the patients still had less mortality with the coiling. Uh, the BRAT trial, six-year follow-up, they found no difference in the clinical outcome, um, and they, they found the complete occlusion was uh, coiling 40%, clipping 95%. The two, really have to work, the two techniques really have to work together. So how do we put them into clinical practice? The upper left shows um, the endovascular treatment arm. When a patient comes in with a ruptured aneurysm, and if it can be 
equally treated either way by the surgeon, the endovascular surgeon, um, then we tend to lean towards coiling. That's the, that's the first treatment of choice, if it could be treated either way. If there's vasospasm or if the patient is poor grade or has comorbidities or advanced age, then coiling is actually preferred, even if they could be treated uh, by both techniques. I mean, even if it could be better treated by surgery, technically, uh, we'd lean towards coiling and attempt at coiling for those conditions. Also, posterior circulation aneurysms, basal uh, apex aneurysms, have a very high risk surgically in the acute phase, so um, those would tend to be endovascularly treated. For surgical treatment, aneurysms of the middle cerebral location, which is the, the CAT scan down there in the CTA, um, the MCA location is often better for surgery because there's really no neck to the aneurysm, so the coils have a tough time staying in without occluding the arteries that are going by, the M2 segments. And also in patients who have a hematoma, this patient actually had more of a clot higher up on the scan, they do better with the decompression and attempted clipping, as shown on the left. The upper slide is a, actually a complex PCOM aneurysm, and that is a good uh, coiling there. That was a recent patient. What do we do after the surgery? Uh, securing the aneur aneurysm is really one step, the uh, first step, but then we rely on the intensive care unit and actually, and our intensivists, uh, it has been shown in multiple studies that institutions that do higher volume, more than 35 um, aneurysms per year of, of combined treatments, um, and have neurointensivists, the outcomes are clearly better. And that's actually an American Heart Guideline is to, uh, if you do less than 10 aneurysms per year in an institution, you probably should refer to uh, a center that does higher volume. Okay, so once they're in the ICU and the aneurysm is secured, we used to do triple H therapy, hypertensive, hypervolemic, chemodilution. Now we do single H therapy, hypertension. We do hypertension if the patient's going into vasospasm. About 15% of people will end up having clinical vasospasm. But to start with, we keep the blood pressure normal. We maintain the volume uh, normal. We don't want people to be anemic because of the lower oxygen delivery, so we keep a normal hemoglobin. We don't want a patient to be hyponatremic because of brain swelling, so we keep their sodium up normal or a little above normal. You don't want hyperglycemia because that has a clear uh, poor effect on outcome. And normal temperature. Uh, hyperthermia is not good, and hypothermia has not shown uh, benefit. We administer nimodipine to prevent our uh, vasospasms, a calcium channel blocker. Magnesium, uh, statins, and endothelial antagonists have not been shown to be effective, so those are not in the clinical practice for prevention of vasospasm. We do not do prophylactic angioplasty or even uh, significant hypertension. We do it if they become symptomatic, and then they go to the angio suite for balloon angioplasty or administration of intraarterial uh, nicardipine. And then finally, the best way to prevent all this from happening is predicting rupture. So there's a lot of patients out there who have aneurysms, and you all see them in your clinic. They have um, incidental aneurysms. They present with headache unrelated or dizziness or other things, and you find these things. There are certain things that predict rupture, and these patients probably should be referred for endovascular or surgical treatment. One is size. If it's greater than seven millimeters, it has a higher risk of rupture. If the aspect ratio is greater than two, the aspect ratio is the size of the dome divided by the parent artery diameter. So basically, if the aneurysm is twice the size or greater than the, the artery that feeds it, it's at higher risk of rupturing. Family history or multiplicity of aneurysms uh, puts the patient at higher risk, and they should be uh, treated, likely. The previous subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, if the patient has other aneurysms that have not ruptured, they're at higher risk for aneurysm rupture, and they should be followed very closely and probably treated. Certain locations are higher risk, anterior communicating, posterior communicating, and posterior circulation. Those aneurysms all have higher risk of hemorrhage. Once an aneurysm grows, and this raises the under, underscores the final point is with these treatments, surgery and coiling, these patients probably should be followed with surveillance studies. Um, they don't necessarily have to be every year, maybe every few years, but more is being found that, that once there's some recurrence, the hemorrhage risk per year goes way up, at close to 20%, 18% in one study. So those patients should be treated. And anyone who's an active smoker, uh, that's, that's a a very 
uh, that's being linked very closely to aneurysm growth and rupture.